first time visitors. There's just two announcements for today. The first one is, guys, our t-shirts are finally ready. Let me show you what it looks like. Designed by our very own pastor, pretty cool, hey? So if you want one, you can get one after the service and we'll let you know about the prices. And the other announcement is that uh, it was a very special uh, person's birthday last week. And he's standing there at the back, it's our pastor. So we're going to stand up and say happy birthday to him. But before we do that, we first need to determine what is his spiritual age, okay? So I've been thinking about this and I thought, if God had calculated, how would we do it? Okay, so I, now don't, don't quote me on this because it's not biblical or scriptural. I just, this is my opinion, okay? So I'm thinking we have to take what his maturity age is, what we think how mature he is, and then subtract what he looks like to get the spiritual age. So if you look at what he looks like, and just look at him, what do you think he looks like? I would say 35, except for that gray at the front, it's a, it's a dead giveaway, but if he sees me after the, ser the service, I can fix it. So we'll say that he's, he's looking age, he looks about 35. His maturity level will say 105. If you've heard him teach on revelations, you'll agree with me, it's 105. You guys agree? So his spiritual age will be 70. So we're actually celebrating your 70th today. <laughs> like, I'm so teasing, he's only 45. <laughs> okay, so let's all just stand and sing happy birthday to him. Thank you. Okay, can we see that? Okay, so speaking of birthdays, maybe think about um, this breath that God has put in us, you know? Um, we, we're born with His breath in us. And um, it's kind of like, you know, God is like oxygen. You can't see Him, but you can't survive without Him. And if you go to, uh, it's Genesis 2, 7, it says there, uh, this was in the beginning of time, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. That's pretty powerful that we have God's breath in us. And we need to actually make good use of this breath that's in us. And when we look at our, our pastor as an example, um, and we see how impactful he is, he's really putting to good use that breath of his that God put in him. And we should be too, you know? It's, a, it's an amazing inspiration that we have. But I just want us to look at, let's just look at the respiratory section, uh, um, the respiratory part of your body for a while, okay? Now just picture this. Um, we can't breathe without respiratory, uh, respiratory organs, okay? It's essential for successful breathing. So breathing, the act of respiration is actually an exchange of gases between the external environment and your body, the part of your body that receives the oxygen. And it's the same with God. We received His breath, our bodies received it through an external exchange, which was God. But in order for your body to work successfully, to be effective, to use God's breath, and for your, res your respiratory organs to work effectively, there, there needs to be three things that happen. The, the, the part of your body receiving the oxygen needs to be thin, it needs to be moist, and it needs to have a large surface area, okay? So which is much the same with God. When you receive His breath, and if you want to be effective in using His breath, you need to be thin, meaning you need to have less flesh. It needs to be less of us, more of Him. You need to be moist, meaning we need to be able to learn to soak up His presence, because increased moisture means increased absorption. So we'll be using God's breath in us more effectively. And you also need to have a large surface area. And a large surface area is basically um, allowing God to inhabit us completely and not giving Him parts of us. So just for effective breathing, we need proper absorption and we need to maximize the whole surface area. The same way for God's breath to be effective in us in what we do and how we live our lives, we need to give Him all of us, which means every area of our life. So it can be likened to the respiratory system, okay? If you think about it, God is sneaky like that. Everything um, in science and everything in nature, basically science is the understanding of how God does things. And if you compare God's breath and spiritual uh, uh, part of your body, you can see this is exactly how God operates. But it's just amazing to understand that it's His breath in us. So we need to be effective with this. So I want you guys to try this, okay? So take a deep breath and then pinch your nostrils and hold your breath in. If you're going to faint, then release your breath, okay? Okay, so eventually you have to breathe out, right? Unless you're young and you can hold him out because he doesn't look like he's getting stuff. So basically, okay, okay guys, you can stop. So basically, 
if you breathe in God's breath in, eventually you need to breathe it out. And that's being impactful. So if you breathe him in and you're using him effectively, you need to be breathing out onto other people and impacting them. So if you haven't had God like last night or this morning and you have really good breath, you can breathe on your neighbor and pass on God's breath, okay? Amen? Okay, so we're going to go into praise and worship. You all stand. Father, we recognize you are good. You're extremely good. You're good when we don't think you're good. We're, you're good at all times. Amen. We honor you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we give you complete control. We just recognize you have complete control in this place, in our hearts, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at least now I know I'm 70 years old, so thank you, Amanda, for clarifying that for me. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Um, yeah, the offering is going around. If you're new, you're visiting here, you don't know what says, don't worry about it. Don't feel any pressure. It's, it's not meant, you know, to put, but uh, okay. So you don't need to give if you don't want to. Don't worry about it. <laughs> ah, thank you, Jesus. You know, so... Um, it's nice to keep things simple. What I mean is that Jesus never came to start a religion, right? You know, in the name of religion, people, this and that. He came to give us a relationship. He came to share his life. The basis of this relationship is that his life is shared with us. And the only way that could be possible is if that old sin nature died. Because that sin nature was corrupt. It's like darkness. And darkness cannot be in the same place as light. It's just not possible. I, I was uh, ministering somewhere this morning and um, this uh, scientist came up afterwards. And he, he says he's a, he was a scientist into quantum physics, quantum mechanics, he understands all that kind of stuff, you know. And he was saying, he was, you know, pretty excited about the things that I was sharing. He said, because that's, that's like science, you know, in the spirit, but science in the spirit. Dr. Lake, he, you know, John D. Lake, he was often talking about uh, pneumatology, the science of the spirit. And the, because yeah, Amanda shared something that I was just going to say, just, just like that. Science is the, um, now I forgot exactly what I was going to say, but science is the um, observing what God has done, right? It's not like scientists are pioneering. They're not pioneering anything. They are discovering the power that is out there, the way things work that, that God set up. It's not, they're not like, ooh, the scientist. No, 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 that God is, <laughs> if we want to stand in awe of somebody, something, stand in awe of God. Because God created the heavens and the earth and whew, they keep going and scientists are, 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 are scrambling to discover what's going on. Wow, cool, they discovered this, that God knew that. Yeah, that, that, that is cool, but it's like the big wow is discovering God, living life with him because then we have a relationship with the one who created the universe. And so anyway, it was, um, yeah, I had a brief conversation with him and it was just interesting to hear him say just how yeah it's like you know because it's talking about Christ emanating through us and um, well just what I started to share now so when Jesus took care when he died on that cross he, he suffered and bled for so that our sins could be washed away so that our darkness could be eradicated and so our sins could be forgiven so we could he became sin so we became the righteousness of God. That's, we, we've been through that the last couple Sundays, right? So repeat all that again. But he became sin so that, and then his righteousness was transferred to us who believe. And so our very DNA, our, our, our nature became the righteousness of God. So then the spirit and life of God could therefore inhabit us because our nature was changed. You see, darkness, if you put light in darkness, darkness is destroyed. Okay, it's gone. It's, it's not, you know, darkness can't hang out with like, hey, buddy, buddy, you know, it's, it doesn't work like that. It just cannot. It's physically impossible, scientifically impossible for darkness to dwell inside light. 
Okay, so God had to make us light. Our, he, his righteousness had to be applied to us, and that's the sacrifice, what he, he, he did, because we didn't earn it. He, it was a free gift, but he paid a dear price. It wasn't free for him. We, we partake freely because we could never earn it or pay for it or deserve it, but it cost him a great deal. So we talk about free salvation, a free gift. Yeah, it's, it's, we can partake freely, but it costs Jesus a lot of suffering, a lot of blood, a lot of, you know, to, to bring it to us. So let us realize what we have. There was that song where we were singing, um, um, I, be I belong to you, or um, my life is yours, something like that. And um, what, if, you, if you stop and think about it, what is it like to belong to love? Because God is love, right? First John 4.8. Uh, First John says, uh, if those who don't know how to love don't know God, because God is love, the spirit of love, that true, truly unselfish love, that, that's God. And we can experience and walk in love because we experience and walk in God. So, but what is it like to belong to love? So, my life is yours. You know, the enemy tries to say, oh, that's like, you know, religious, difficult stuff, Ooh. but... To belong to love, that's a good thing. That means we are attached to, we are united with, we are at one with love. God, the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-loving creator of the universe, and we belong to him. So what does that mean? We belong to love. That means we're going to embody love. That's why Jesus said in John 13, he said, by this all will know that you are my followers, my disciples, if you have love one for another. That is the one thing the devil cannot imitate. He may be able to conjure up some power and do a parlor trick miracle and, and you know, get some guys to levitate off the ground. You go visit some yogis in India, you see some of this stuff. The devil has some power, doesn't have love. That is one thing that he cannot Imitate is the sacrificial, all-encompassing love that would cause somebody to lay down their life for another, which Jesus embodied. Jesus embodied love, and he showed us the path to walk on and to do the same. So when he's talking about that those who believe in him will do the same works and greater, yes, he's talking about the miracles and healings and all these things, but he's talking about the opportunities we have to embody his love because we, def we face a defeated enemy now. Jesus conquered sin and death. So sin and death is conquered so his love can go into places and you know, we, we can pick up the phone and express love to people. We can hop on a plane. We can, Jesus didn't have a plane, you know. Jesus didn't have a phone, you know. But we have so many possibilities to embody God's love to people. And Jesus said, make sure you stay salty. He um, says, if, a, if salt, you know, you've got your nice food in front of you, needs a little salt, okay? So you put the salt on. What if that salt lost its taste? And so there's no salt. It's, it's very... Uh, Okay, well, I didn't. <laughs> salt makes you thirsty. That's what I really wanted to go to. It's not just about taste. Salt makes you thirsty. <laughs> okay, so when we are being salty, we are living like Jesus. You know, I was in the gym, and um, there was this lady on Friday I'm walking by with the crutch and. The, um, Something with her eye, I think it was a cataract or something. Just, I walked by, didn't stop her. But love just grabs hold and says, what are you doing? What walking by? If you believe truly that I would touch her and change her, wouldn't you stop? You know, I've heard this line before from God. Reminding me of this. You know, sometimes you just need a reminder. You know, that's what life in the spirit doesn't mean, you know, you're always doing everything perfect, but, but perfect.
but you are attuned. So when that reminder comes, okay, yes, Lord. And, and you get in line to do what your Savior would do. His heart is reaching out. Love is reaching out. Doubt, unbelief, impressions of people, fears, all of that tries to keep us captive. We need to learn to be free. God wants to set us free. The greatest freedom we will ever experience is freedom from the fear of what other people think and the fear of doubt and unbelief that generates fear, fear of what if this, what if that. And just look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Believe his word and we live accordingly. See, it's very simple, right? But we need to bring every thought captive. We need to reign in that human, fleshly, carnal nature, which is so concerned with everything else. <sighs> Who's looking over here, and what if this, and what, and what is she going to think, and if I stop? Anyway, so I turned around <laughs> and went back. Um, and, you know, she has had this paradigm of sangomas and this and that, but she, she was open to allow me to pray for her, minister to her, and, and you know, the pain was draining away and all of these things, and, and she was walking more easily and all these things. So Jesus came into her paradigm, and there was a shift. You know, God's love, because truly, it was only to the glory of His love, which is His Spirit embodies love and reminds us, right? Hey, what are you doing? Get back there. You know, and, and if we're smart, we will flow with God. You know, we will not harden our hearts. You see, that's, it's so important. Where is our heart facing? Is our heart open toward God? You know, we need to stay malleable in his hands. We need to be responsive. And I'm not saying I've always got it right. This is one where recent and I did, but I've shared also times when I did not obey. And, you know, um, so, but what I'm saying is much better to obey the voice of the Lord, obey the voice of love, to truly belong to love so that love channels our actions. If we want to represent Christ, it's got to be that way. You know, we have to give up our right to be independent from God. You see, the God of this world is the God of preaching independence. You know, just, you are your own God. That sounds very familiar, way back in the Garden of Eden, right? You don't need anybody, in, you are the captain of your fate, the master of your soul, you are... Well, I'd rather belong to love because love does not exist in that world, the world of me. Love is God. Love is a being. Love is a, has a personality. Love um, reacts a certain way, does certain things to help, to heal, to set people free, to deliver. So the question if love will permeate and saturate our being is where is the direction of our heart? Is our heart truly, because with the heart we believe, which results in righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made resulting in salvation, Romans 10 tells us. So it is with our heart that we believe. It's not a mental wrestling where we try to convince ourselves. If our heart needs to be looking unto Jesus, because only through that relationship can he be experienced. And so many people try to achieve certain things spiritually, but leaving the relationship of God out of it, and so it becomes religion. <laughs> Religious effort, a human effort, a, a kind of striving in the flesh. But we need to keep it simple. 
We need to keep it true. What that means is it's about walking with God. It's about giving our life unto Him as He laid down His life for us, and then there is a union where the two become one. And it's no longer you, God, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, where the fiber of your being is now energized with His DNA and His spiritual energy, and the two have become one. So when you lay your hands on somebody, the Spirit of God is going to come through. Sometimes we forget what we have. Sometimes we forget how powerful Christ is in and through us when we believe. And that's why it's so important. Well, not that, that's why, but when we minister to others, when we, uh, like the uh, analogy of the, the, um, Amanda was sharing about the breathing, we breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe in. Okay, there needs to be, when we are reaching out and sharing Jesus with people and, you know, um, ministering healing or, or whatever the case may be, God's Spirit comes through. And sometimes, it's just a reminder of who we are when you minister to somebody and God just totally rocks their worlds. You know, and, and we, we live with, with God. But we need to realize somebody who, who is not living life in God. They don't know Jesus. And, and, and then you come along, a believer who believes, who, who knows their God, that his word is true. And you minister to somebody and, and the spirit touches them and they, they are affected. I mean, their, their world is rocked. It's, we need to remember who we are. We're an extension of the kingdom of God. We're an extension. We're the body of Christ. His body, you know, your, your body, you don't think about moving your hand, your fingers, but your brain is, you're deciding, and then so your brain sends the signal and, and they move. We need to be so at one with him, with our heart focus on him, that we can get those impulses of the spirit. We, we get the direction, the vo hear the voice of the Lord. We, his, his spirit can nudge us, say, hey, stupid. Oh, oh right. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, he wouldn't say, hey, stupid. Well, he, but he wants to lead us. Sometimes we, we are a little dense and we need a little kick. You know what I'm saying? Um, but it's much better. <sighs> Let's walk with the Lord. Okay, that, that was not what it was. Anyway, that was the in <laughs> introduction there. His DNA, his, our old nature of darkness is, is no more. Now we are a new creation, his righteousness, so he infuses us with his spirit. You, if you could see, it, it'd be nice, you know how they have an x-ray machine. You go to the doctor's office, they have an x-ray machine, they can look into your flesh, see your bones and stuff like that. It would be very interesting to have a spiritual x-ray machine, Right? And, and you would see, if you looked at yourself in the mirror in a spiritual x-ray machine, you would see a radiance. I think I shared last week, right, about the, um, the, the Christian walking in the city and, and um, the Satanist seeing a light and all that kind of thing, right? Because the spirits can see, and the, you know, they, they, that's their realm, they see what's going on there. Sometimes we, we, we don't see... But yet, if we could, we would see the glory of God emanating from us. Because where is Jesus? Christ in you. So if, you, if we could see in the Spirit, in a, in a way our faith would rise. But God said, blessed are those who don't see yet still believe. You know? So God has chosen to, to make it in such a way that we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And that's the way he set it up. So that... We need to stay close to Him so that we, we need to maintain that relationship with Him so that we can see clearly Him and know that His Word is true and so we can act on it. But if we really could see in the Spirit, I believe you would see these radiant lights, Christ, just the shining aura of God all around us. So just realize that's who you are. Christ is in you. If you are a believer, if you have given your life to Jesus then the Spirit of God, His very life has come in to you 
And the reason his life is there is so that he can come through us, so that he can heal the sick. He can change that situation. When we step out and believe in faith, that all things are possible. And Jesus said, if you truly believe everything is possible and do not doubt in your heart, there will be no impossibilities for you. And we will be led by his character, his nature, his love, and life will have purpose and meaning way beyond this fleshly human existence or rat race in some cases, you know. Without God, it's, it's like a treadmill, you know. But with God, we can do whatever we're going to do, and we can impart His life all along the way. And He can bless whatever we touch, you know. And He wants to bless the works of our hands and everything He does if we do it in Him and with Him. In Revelation 3, 12, it says, To him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will not go out any more. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God's intention for us is to be a pillar in his kingdom. We each have that DNA, his DNA. If we're a believer, we have Christ in us. The potential to be a pillar is there. But it's what we do with what he has given that makes all the difference. He has given us life, eternal life. He has given us his spirit. What are we doing? Okay, so it is the decisions we make every day to limit ourselves to think like Jesus, to respond like Jesus, to do what he would do that helps project his spirit, that, that God sees he, we want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a, f a few things, have rule over many cities. The parable of the talents, right? God sees what we do with what our environment where we are so that he can make us a pillar in his kingdom. He, in his kingdom, there's a lot of responsibilities and, and that God will give to those who are faithful. So... The thing is, we keep it simple by keeping our relationship with the Lord strong. He is our focus. We enjoy Him. We walk with Him. And through that, God sees that we are faithful and He will put us into situations where we'll be able to influence those situations. But it, it, it goes back to our walk with Him in simplicity, in faith, in love. So, but he wants to, 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 that's what he has for us, to be a pillar in his kingdom. You know, he created Adam and Eve, it says, uh, he created all mankind in his image, in his likeness. And so, we have the capacity to relate to God, to talk with him, to understand his heart. Why? Because he created us that way. He did not create us to be um, you know, just like uh, do this, do that, and we don't really understand. He created us to walk with him. Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the cool of the day, and, and they had a capacity for understanding the consciousness of God. Okay, <clears throat> what I mean. The consciousness of God, it says, the scripture tells us, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Spirit of your mind. Yes, the, the, the consciousness, your, your whole paradigm way of where you make your decisions. And you see, God wants to renew that. He wants to upgrade the way that we think, the spirit of our mind, he, our conscious way that we think about things. You will experience life. Look, you cannot, you and I cannot, you walk it down the road. You don't... Um, Two people can walk down the road, the same road, and experience the same uh, things that happen to them. But the response can be entirely different. And thus, the joy, the experience, the interaction with those situations that person B has, as opposed to person A, can be completely godlike and changing those situations, or person A can let it roll over, those situations roll over him and, and bring him down. So it is, it's not what happens, 
It's how we respond to what's going on. And we have a choice to respond with the consciousness of Christ, his paradigm, faith to move mountains, faith to raise the dead, faith to change whatever needs to be changed like Jesus would do if he was here, right? Or we start analyzing in the flesh. So God is here. To, he, he wants us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. He wants us to be... Um, to, to bring us into his own consciousness, not just so we can change the world, which is part of our mandate to transform the world and all of that and help those who need help, but so that he can have closer fellowship with us and so that our way of thinking and our experience with himself is closer and without barriers of... A different way of thinking you know it's you know um, God is bringing us into his heavenly culture there is a culture we need to understand of the kingdom of heaven of how God does things that heavenly culture is very different to earthly culture earthly culture says ABC God says no that won't be necessary just believe and my very life and spirit will bring transformation so God doesn't think in the realm of impossibilities he doesn't think in the realm of of limitations but human worldly nature does so we choose our consciousness we choose which paradigm we're going to walk in the mind of Christ or the mind of this world. Okay, it's much better. The, the, the culture of heaven, the kingdom of God, God's uh, way of thinking. But through all of this, God is drawing us closer into experiencing him more. That's what he's really after. He's not just after somebody to do stuff for him. <laughs> okay, we do this stuff because we want to embody the love of God because we care about people and God is love and his love is birthed within us and so compassion compels us. The love of Christ constrains me, the Apostle Paul said, right? So yes, we do react based upon the need and, and things. But what God is really after is a relationship. He's after a dialogue. He's after intimacy. He's after... He, 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 he created us. Why do... Uh, why does a, a husband and wife, why do they want to have children? They want a continuation of life and to share who they are, to share that life with the, their children, right? And you want a child to grow in, in wisdom and understanding. You can relate to and interact with. God is the same. He created us with the capacity, he, he created us in his image, in his likeness, so that we can think like him, interact like him, and, and thus have that relationship so close. That's what he's after. Okay, so let's keep it simple. Living the Christian life based upon this relationship. The one thing we need to go after is, is our relationship with God. If there's one thing, one focus, this needs to be it. Walking with our God, spending time with our God, getting to know our God. And, you know, when we talk about doing the works of Christ, that is one way we get to know him, because when we do what he said, then his spirit, there's an interaction with his spirit that takes place, and we begin to understand some, the things of God through what he does through us, you know. When we go and we minister healing to somebody, and we pray and, and we say, in Jesus' name, be healed. And God comes through and his spirit he, heals them. And, and, and we share some words with that person. I mean, what's happening? I mean, there's an interaction with God through that as well, where we understand how he does things. And, how, and that understanding of, of him renews the spirit of our mind, our paradigm, our consciousness. And we begin to 
all the little, all the barriers that separate us in our way of thinking from God and, and things begin to fall. And God is just longing for that day when there's no more barriers. It's just relationship. And we can know Him, and our life will be a life lived of a powerful life, like Jesus, of transformation. But that's what He's after. He's after that relationship and that... Um, um, that walk with him. Adam and Eve, why did they fall? Because they, they started to doubt God's word, right? Did God really say? And so these barriers came up, so the unbelief. So we need to guard, we need to protect the word of God in our mind. God said this, if, if we allow doubt and unbelief, then spiritually that thing will die what could have been, you know? So we need to guard and bring every thought captive to life, every thought captive to love, every thought captive to Christ. And then if we do that, life, all those seeds of life begin to spring, spring forth. Those seeds of provision, those seeds of, of um, healing, those seeds of every promise of the Word of God. It's like a garden, and our heart are, is like a garden. And what we allow to be planted there is what will grow and what we give place to. That's what's growing. Every single one of us in our heart have things growing there. We need to guard the garden of our heart, make sure there's, we take out the weeds. You don't want weeds to overrun and choke the fruitful things there. You don't want the false ideas and the doubts and the unbelief to take over and, and thus your life is lived that way. We want the life of God to spring forth. So the seeds of the Word of God need to go into good soil. What is good soil? Receptive, believing, and we act upon what God's Word says. So we, we hear God's Word, we allow God's Word to penetrate into our heart, and then we believe and we live by His Word. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. If we live that way and we guard and protect what God's Word says, we will begin to see. You know, the scripture, Jesus talked about how um, the kingdom of heaven is like seed sowed in a field, and the farmer doesn't know how it's growing, but it does, and he sees the fruit of it. We keep going, we keep believing, we keep walking with our God, and His life will, will come, uh, come through. <clears throat> Abraham, you know, we know it says that he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. The Spirit of God is attracted by righteousness. Christ is our righteousness, so he's attracted to Christ in us. And so when we walk in the righteousness of God, which is believing, Abraham believed God. Okay, James 2.20. It says, it talks about faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered Isaac? his son, on the altar. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. So faith and works, they, they must go together. If you have faith, you will have, you will take action. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham believing God resulted in an action of faith Okay, and so God was able to work through that. And that was accounted to him, this believing and acting upon that belief, that, that was accounted to him for righteousness. So now we are righteous because of Christ, right? But when we take believing actions in faith, stepping out to do what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is drawn to that. The, the Holy Spirit is busy in that environment of faith. And so that he is drawn to the righteousness of Christ in action. So the more that we allow, uh, the more that we step out to do the word of God and to, and to um, the Holy Spirit is drawn to that faith which is accounted as righteousness and an expression of, of Christ. Revelations 5, 9 and 10, it's, it talks about being made kings and priests. He's made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. This is God's job description for us, to be a pillar in his kingdom, to reign on the earth. So, 
you may be sitting there thinking, oh, that doesn't look like my life experience. <laughs> Reigning. How does the king... I mean, Jesus is called the king of kings, right? Lord of lords. So there's kings. Jesus is the king of the kings. But that means there's other kings. Okay? He's made us, made us, made us a nation of kings and priests. Revelation 5, 10. And we shall reign on the earth. Not unless we learn to now. I tell you what, to be a pillar in his kingdom and to reign when he sets up his kingdom on earth and all of that, we're not going to be reigning, filling that, that place by his side in that capacity unless we learn to live that way now. God desires us to be by his side in that capacity. But this life that we live now is the opportunity we have to, to walk and believe accordingly to prove whether that's really our place or not by his side in that capacity. Jesus loves us. He will always love us. It's, I'm not talking about performance for relationship. What I'm talking about enjoying God. I'm talking about walking with Him. So all of these other things, they're, His yoke is easy. His burden is light. It's not a burden to be carried if Jesus really is our focus. So we need to make sure that He is our focus so that we can then live out all that God has for us. Okay, Romans eight seventeen. If we're children of God, then we are heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And remember that um, I think Andre was sharing before about uh, the Jewish culture. In the Jewish culture, the inheritance was given to the children at the beginning of their life, not the, not the end. And so when he was talking about inheritance, our inheritance in Christ, is talking about the life that we have. We have that inheritance now. And so in the Jewish culture, when, uh, I don't know what age, was it? but when, by the time the, the, the child was ready to leave the nest, so to speak, they had their inheritance. And that inheritance was to enable them to do whatever they needed to do in life. And so Christ is our inheritance. And we have everything we need for life and godliness in Christ. And he, God is our inheritance to live this life, not just when we die and we go to heaven. And then, you know, we, we have our inheritance. Yes, there are aspects of it that we will enjoy in heaven, but God is our inheritance and he, and he wants to participate now in the life we're living now. <clears throat> God has that desire for companionship and that's why he created us. Just like the parents want to have a, a children, God loves that journey with us. He loves that walk with us. Let us make sure that we are living in that place of fellowship with him. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the enemy of this life is fear. I already mentioned a little bit, but Satan wants to paralyze us so that we don't live this life in Christ. If you look at the life of Jesus, we, we know it was a life, he lived so effectively, he lived so miraculously, right? And we know that that's the life he has for us. He said the same works and greater. But fear, Satan tries to use fear to paralyze us. So we need to be, just to identify and make sure that we're not giving place to Satan. You know, it says, give no place to the enemy. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will f uh, flee from you and give no place to him. So what are the types of fear? Well, we mentioned, you know, fear of what people are going to think. When, if you know God and you know the promises of God and you know what he wants you to do, when there's opportunity to live and interact with people in that way and to share the gospel with them or to, you know, maybe minister healing to them or to give a word to them or whatever the case may be, the enemy will try to paralyze you so you don't do it. Why? Because he doesn't want God's life 
spilling out through you, the rivers of living water, the Spirit of God coming through you and affecting somebody else. So he tries to um, bottle us up through fears. We know God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. So those are the, that, that's the antidote right there. That's the life God gives us. Power, 2 Timothy 1, 7. Power, love, and the sound mind. If we are operating in the power of God, in the love of God, in the sound mind of Christ, we will not fear. So to identify whether fear is paralyzing us or not, just think, how are you operating? Are you operating in the power, love, and sound mind of Christ? Or fear, doubt, unbelief, and worry. <clears throat> God has not given us that spirit of fear. So we need to purposefully cast ourselves upon God to believe His Word, no plan B. Just cast ourselves, to cast our cares on Him too. His yoke is easy, His burden is light. We, like children, believe God. Take Him at His Word. We are to fear God, the, the Scripture tells us. In Isaiah 11, 2, says the Spirit of the Lord, it's talking about uh, the Messiah, Jesus here, the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon Him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So Jesus feared the Lord. His heavenly, there was a healthy awe and respect, that kind of fear, which, <clears throat> over, which outshined any other type of fear and swallowed up. So this holy fear of God is like light. The enemy's fear is like the darkness. So if we're walking in the light, the fear of the Lord, then it automatically swallows up and destroys the enemy's fears. Fears of what people are going to think, how they're going to respond. Imagine just walking into wherever environment where you walk normally, and you just did what Jesus wanted you to do every single time. Without thought or worry of what people think, without fear of what if it doesn't work, which is doubt and unbelief without any of those paralyzing fears. Life would be very simple and full of joy and powerful. But the fear and the doubt and the unbelief and that the enemy tries to put with on us paralyzes all of that. You re we can just observe that some people But, okay, just, oh, I'm going to go back there now. Just, just imagine that, you, that we live life that way, without, without fear and worry. Do you know that we give place to the enemy? The enemy cannot break down our door and just, we just have to crumble. We choose to open the door. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. It's up to us, even with Jesus, to open the door and commune with him, Revelation 3.20. So we decide what pressurizes us or not. We decide to open the door to fear, doubt, and unbelief and live life captive to the opinions of people or not. Jesus was not held prisoner by any of these things. He lived, but how? How did he get to that place? While it was still early and everybody's snoozing, Jesus was spending time with his Father. He made sure that the relationship that he shared with his Father would never be diluted with other things. That he could live life in this world, but so saturated by the Spirit of his Father because of his relationship and because of the way he protected that relationship that focus, that Heavenly Father focus, that prayer time, that walking with God, that 
not allowing the doubt and fears and unbelief to come be through the choice of his heart. Because with the heart we believe and we face it towards the light and that is what is going to affect us. Where your heart goes, that's where you go. That's what affects you. But we control the direction of our heart. God does not even control the direction where we choose to focus our heart. So the heart is what God is after. The heart is what the enemy is after too. The heart will dictate your life experience. And so we need to allow Jesus, the Spirit of God, to fill our heart, to give him full place so that we can walk with God and then um, by doing so, this healthy fear of the Lord, the, this, this fear of, look, I, I, I want to, it's not a, it's just a, a byproduct of relationship. It's a, it's a natural thing that happens, a healthy awe and respect, because the closer we walk with the Lord, the more we realize how awesome he is. The more we realize he's the king, <laughs> he's in control. He is the powerful, almighty creator of the universe, and it is a privilege and an honor to serve him. Okay? Yet, he pulls us up to be his sons and his daughters, children of the Most High God. What, an, what a privilege. But you see, what does sometimes happen for some is because of that relationship where God has pulled us up to be his sons and his daughters, people become uh, frivolous or, or um, sort of, ah, you know, everything, nothing really matters. I mean, it's all just cool, you know, my... It's, but the fear of the Lord, our love for the Lord, which causes us to enter into interactive relationship with him, and the byproduct of the awe and wonder and fear of the Lord will cause us to be, we, we, we engage in that relationship with him, that privileged place of being seated with him, yet we know always he's the boss. <laughs> he's our God. He is worthy for us to cast our crown down at his feet, even though he has put his righteousness and everything on us, but yet he is king and there is a recognition. So the fear of the Lord is the recognition that God is worthy to be worshiped that he is worthy as creator, as the embodiment of love who gives us the privilege. He, he shares his life and love with us and we get to partake of it. I mean, so there is that fear of the Lord will cause us not to fear people, will cause us not to be a prisoner of the thoughts and opinions of others. Because a life lived in prison to the thoughts and opinions of others will always, that means the enemy can control us. That means he can steal your joy. That means he can, uh, you know, have some weird, some, you know, some, and just something happen. And, but imagine a place where nothing would steal our joy. Where the joy of the Lord truly is our strength and nothing, doesn't matter what you may experience. Okay, just forget about all doctrines now and just say whatever, the, the worst possible things that could go wrong, they go wrong. Okay, now set aside, yes, but Jesus protect. Okay, just forget all that for a moment. And just, what if? You know, just everything went wrong, like Job. <laughs> okay. okay, he wasn't in the New Covenant. He didn't have that. Okay, there's a whole story there. But just, to, okay, let's say that happened. A Job situation happened. Everything. But what if nothing could steal your joy anyways? Because of your love and your walk with God. Isn't that a nice place to be? Isn't it a wonderful place to be free to walk with God? And that freedom will cause a different way of thinking in your life. You see, we can decide that now to walk with God in that way. That nothing, we would never, God is God. 
He is always worthy. He is always good, always worthy to be worshipped, like the question we asked in the beginning. And we settle that fact. So it doesn't matter what we experience on this earth. That worshipful, reverential attitude and worship toward God will always be there. And we live from there. We we act from there. We believe his word and we do his word. It is that should be the core of our life, that worship to worship God in spirit and truth. And to allow nothing to invade that place where the joy of the Lord is birthed from that place of worshiping God in spirit and truth. We grow in various ways. We grow up into Christ in all things. But it is from that place of worshipfulness towards God in spirit and truth that, that we guard and we protect and we interact with God. Then everything else will emanate from that place and we will grow up into Christ in all things. In Ephesians 3, it talks about how, you know, to know that we must know the love of Christ if we want to grow up into the fullness of God. We must know the love of Christ. It's, it's not just about, you know, doing things. It's, it's knowing him. It's allowing nothing to penetrate that secret place that would allow us to um, a break in our worship of God himself. If we can keep that place, if we can decide that now and say, you know what, for the rest of my life, I'm not going to allow anything, doesn't, anything to steal the joy of my salvation away in my worshiping God in spirit and truth and, in, and interacting with him in a reverential, you're worthy to be praised, worshiped, no matter what's happening. If we decide that now and we protect that and we interact in our relationship with God from that point, I guarantee everything else will get into hyperdrive. You ever seen Star Trek? <laughs> when they, they, I don't know, get into warp speed, light speed, whatever they do. At a certain point, you know, they're going, but man, and when they flip on that light speed, <clears throat> the enemy's just like, where'd he go? They're gone. Out of the reach of the enemy. God wants us to get into hyperdrive. <laughs> light speed. What, what's the technical? It's, I don't know. The what? Warp speed. Okay, warp speed. <laughs> the what? Warp speed. Okay, yeah, we know what you've been watching. Okay, so God is saying, you know, but, oh yeah, now I'm remembering now. So, but they needed their like power generator functioning to get into that warp speed, right? If that uh, source of the power was not active, they can only go pretty fast, but they're not going to hit warp speed to get away from all grips of the enemy, right? So that, that power source is worshiping God in spirit and truth. The decision that not, no earthly situation, we are not going to allow any earthly situation to dictate how we worship our God. Because he's worthy of our worship. His word is true. He is faithful. He's not a liar. We need to settle that and give him the honor and the glory and the faith, the believing heart, the direction of our heart that he deserves that is the power generator for warp speed. And then we live life in that place. And our spiritual life and growth and growing up into Christ, bringing all the experiential aspects into alignment with the way it should be according to God's word, will be in a much faster track because we've learned to guard that secret place in our relationship with him and interact with him it, no matter what's going on. And from there, we, the heart will find it easier to believe because with the heart, we believe. Thank you, Jesus. So, okay, we need to wrap it up here, huh? Um, in Romans 8, it says, 
We did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. See, the law it just kept people kind of fearful. Oh, man, I stumbled fear and all this thing. We did not receive the spirit of bondage. That's a bondage, that fear. But we have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That's where God, our Heavenly Father wants us to live with Him. Where we're, we're there in that secret place, no matter what's going on, and we can still say, Daddy, I love you. You're awesome. <laughs> you know, and nothing, nobody, neither height nor depth nor any other created thing can separate us from the love of Christ. The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the freedom God has for us. We don't know life until we know the love of God and a, and a relationship with God. There we become free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Truly free. People think they're free because they can go to a club and do that. No, it's not free. The true freedom comes from within. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is within you. When we enthrone God as Lord of all and we worship Him in spirit and in truth, light speed, warp drive, spirit, and freedom comes. The enemy's like, was trying to get us and then all of a sudden we disappeared out of His reach because in that secret place of love and worship and trust in God, the enemy cannot penetrate. Cannot. The fear of the enemy cannot penetrate that place. So let us live from that place. Father, I thank you that you've even given us this possibility, this, this opportunity, this... You've opened the door to us to, to oh, interact with you in this way. Your very life you've opened up to us and we get to partake of your joy, your life, indifferent what's going on. But not only that, we truly become an extension of your kingdom, and we do operate in your authority, your power, your glory comes and shines through, but may we never lose sight that it's about you, to worship you in spirit and truth, and even if the whole world just turned upside down and all of these things, nobody, nothing, no force of darkness, we will not give up our inheritance of the joy of the Lord and worshiping you in spirit and in truth and the freedom that you've birthed within us as a result of that. So we give honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. If anybody would like prayer for anything, you're welcome to um, grab one of us and be happy to do that. Um, if um, there's, if you didn't, um, if you're visiting and you didn't fill out a visitor's card and you'd like to be in touch and so we can inform you things that are happening and stuff, there's a card right there or raise your hand and you will get one. It'll come to you. You're also welcome to take a little DVD there. Um, and we have uh, our home base meeting this week, Life Teams, where it's more interactive and we can dialogue and pray about things and stuff. And um, so that is on... Uh, Thursday, this Thursday, if you'd like more info about that, just let us know. God bless you. There is a birthday cake out here somewhere. Is, is it out there? Okay, I'll, I'll pass the mic. I'll give you. God bless you. So. <laughs>